Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. It's so good to see so many of you here this evening for this public lecture brought to you by the Department of Mathematics at LSE. My name is Martin Anthony, and I'm a member of the Mathematics Department here. Our speaker tonight is Professor Nello Cristianini. I've known Nello for a very long time. He's currently Professor of Artificial Intelligence at the University of Bath, and before that, he's held academic positions at the University of Bristol and the University of California, Davis. Nello's um, been involved in machine learning and related topics for a long time. He carried out some very important fundamental work on the mathematical underpinnings of support vector machines and kernel methods, and has also worked on bioinformatics and the analysis of text and media. His recent interests have been in philosophical and ethical questions about artificial intelligence and its role in our lives. And he has recently published a very uh, nice book that I thoroughly recommend, uh, The Shortcut, Why Intelligent Machines Do Not Think Like Us. It's a very accessible and a succinct and thorough account of some of what he's going to talk about tonight, no doubt. So I can't recommend that book enough. And it's my great pleasure to welcome Nello this evening. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you, Martin, for the introduction. I, I should add only one thing. I've been doing this for a long time, but the first book I read about the theory of machine learning was Martin Anthony's book. So I think it's nice coming full circle. And, uh, and I still have it in Bath. So uh, what does it mean to be intelligent? Does it work? Wait. Moment. <laughs> Did you put all the slides here? Yeah, only one slide. You know why? Because I showed off by email and I said, I can do this without slides, no problem. No, there we are. So now they are doing it. Is that your first slide? No, yeah. this is the tenth. Is it missing a large number of slides? Oh, wait, right, go to the top. Okay, that's interesting. Okay. Um, uh, we are missing a certain number. Um, yeah, they were blank. I don't know what that means. Strange. Is it the full screen that's the problem? I, they're just not appearing. I think this is the first. I can just start talking from slide number. Nine. Is that okay? No. But Sorry. I can talk anyway. I was joking. I, I don't need them. We'll, I don't we'll need try them. and sort it in the meantime. Yeah, but I, I don't need them. And uh, it's, it's like this. <clears throat> I just have to remember me. Uh, yes, so what does it mean to be intelligent is a question that is not just theoretical these days. We are actually all engaged with this strange philosophical question. What does it mean? Because we are facing machines that might or not be intelligent. And uh, a person dealing with this question directly a long time ago was the astronomer Carl Sagan, who was uh, an American astronomer. And uh, at some point in the 70s, he was asked by NASA to come up with the strangest message you can be asked to write. NASA were sending a spacecraft, Pioneer 10, that was destined to leave the solar system and travel forever in the interstellar space. So they had this idea that it should carry a message on it, just in case some alien intelligence one day would find it. And they thought, Professor Sagan, can you write a message that can be understood by any alien intelligence in general? So he thought about it. He met with his colleagues and his students, 
physics students and physics colleagues. And they decided that uh, there is a way to communicate with every form of intelligence in the universe by using whatever we have in common. And they, they reasoned, well, we, whatever they are, they must have evolved in the same universe, subject to the same physical laws and the same mathematical principles. They must understand that much. Let's put the molecule of hydrogen Let's put a, a map of the solar system. Let's put a bunch of molecules and prime numbers and things like that. That much they must know. And that was engraved on a golden plaque and mounted on the craft, spacecraft and sent and it's currently traveling in space. Did they send a binary coding of pi or something? Or? The year later, <laughs> Sagan had a further idea and thought, why do we have to rely on a little artifact? Let's use a radio telescope. And they sent a bunch of sequences based on the principles of prime numbers. It wasn't Pi, though. It was a much more convoluted than that. But there were some prime numbers involved. And again, the signal was sent into space with the idea that uh, any sort of intelligence must understand prime numbers. So neither message has been answered yet. And um, I had this idea of attempting a replication experiment and I showed both the golden plaque and the prime numbers, the bit, the bit sequence, to my cat. My cat is a type of intelligence which not only evolved in the same universe, subject to the same physical laws, but even in the same planet. And we have so much phylogenetic history in common and even grew up in my own house. Cat hasn't responded to either message yet. <laughs> and, and it started becoming quite concerning as a counterexample because if not even the cat answers, why should an alien intelligence care? And the question is, there must have been something wrong with the fundamental assumptions that Sagan made about the intelligent being, which goes back to what does it mean to be intelligent? And the problem he made, the, the mistake he made is this, I believe. He couldn't imagine something fundamentally different from him. He could only imagine another theoretical physicist with the same knowledge of prime numbers and molecules of hydrogen and so on and so forth. And therefore, then he says, how can I talk to this other entity? Let's use the, that. But even if the very same messages had been sent to Leonardo da Vinci or Galileo Galilei, they wouldn't have been able to understand Newton, of course, I should say Newton, uh, because they didn't know about the molecule of H2. And uh, even today, if you go in you can find, for sure, if you want some part of the world where they have better problems, then they don't care about prime numbers. So it is very hard to imagine something fundamentally alien a fundamentally different than us, including in terms of intelligent beings. And that question is the one we face today as we try to regulate intelligent machines, because it's hard to imagine that they are fundamentally different types of intelligence than we are from, from us. And if we keep on imagining there is another human being there, then we are going to try and make the laws and the principles and the values that don't apply to the machines. And that will not be safe. So now we are facing this kind of philosophical, old-fashioned philosophical questions. And one is, what does it mean to be intelligent? So one, one, one um, to make it short, one way to think of it is to, to think that intelligence existed on this planet way before us. We know that animals existed before the first human being existed, before the first word was spoken, and therefore intelligence doesn't mean to be human and doesn't require language or logic or self-consciousness. We know that uh, in the bottom of the primordial oceans, uh, fishes were chasing each other and escaping and outwitting and competing. Dinosaurs were hunting in park and, and so on and so forth. Intelligence existed before us. It doesn't need all the other things that we, we think. And um, we see evidence of brains and so on, you know. Uh, what is it then? Well, it turns out that uh, the, the, the psychologist Piaget had a, different, a decent answer. It was, uh, intelligence is the ability of knowing what to do when you do not know what to do. 
So if you are presented with a specific situation you've seen before and you know how to handle, you just have to remember that. If you want to build a spam filter for your computer, you could have a table of all the emails that count as spam, and if you see them again, you block them. What about a new message you haven't seen before? The same is for chess. If I tell you in this chess configuration that is the right move, you can remember that. What about a new configuration you've not seen before? and so on, translation, you can imagine driving the Tesla. Every time you are in a new situation you haven't seen before, you can't rely on memorization, you must work it out. You must sort of comprehend, understand, make sense of it. Knowing what to do in these cases requires some sort of understanding. And that's the beginning of intelligence, and that is why it is so useful to have, because you can take an animal from one environment and put it in a different garden, maybe, <coughs> a bird changing garden they can still find the food and the shelter they need. Intelligence is very useful. So let's use it as a definition of knowing what to do in unseen, unknown, unique situations. And, um, and then you start finding that intelligence is pretty much everywhere. And, um, and machines can be intelligent too. And that's important. And in fact, uh, if you if you use in the morning uh, YouTube or whatever, uh, Instagram, it will be able to recommend content to you. Um, its goal is probably to keep you clicking. Uh, it will have to try and choose the best possible content for you when uh, this content was not created until yesterday. So the machine, the program doesn't know. The answer it has to work it out. New user, new content, find the right choices. Mm -hmm. So Amazon does it, recommends books for you. Uh, Instagram and YouTube recommend content to you, always with the same purpose. They make decisions, they, they, they follow their goals, they pursue their goals. In that sense, they behave in a goal-driven, adaptive, intelligent way, in that sense. So that kind of intelligence has been in our pockets for a very long time, in our telephones, I mean. And um, it's today quite an important part of, of, of the ecosystem of information. We deployed it, even before we go into GPT. So an interesting question is, how did we do that? How did we build that kind of uh, entity that can behave intelligently in those conditions? Because, you know, for a very long time, we tried, we started in 1950, the first articles of 1950, but for decades and decades we tried in a way that wasn't working. In fact, the mistake computer scientists made initially for the 60s and 70s were very much like the mistakes of Carl Sagan. They tried to build a machine that looks pretty much like a person, thinks in the way we think, or in the way we, as we, we thought we think, because the, the truth we don't know how we think for real. But the idea of building a logic system that can reason logically about stuff symbolically, following specific laws explicitly, was the first attempt. In fact, in the specific case of language, this is very visible. So imagine, I use a language as, as an example. You can apply this to vision and other tasks. Language is what machines process most these days. So you give a document, an email, and they can make a summary, or they can make a translation, or block it. In the case of language, you have an interesting problem. Uh, you have to, for example, in translation, you have to recognize a good text, a viable, valid text from another one. And that's not an easy task. And for a long time, machine translation people have dealt with this question. How do I know if a translation is valid English? And they, they hired many linguists. They created grammatical rules. They came up with a series of theories, and IBM was leading this effort, and uh, it, it didn't really work very well. We probably know, it was a reasonable attempt. If you want to send a spacecraft on Mars, we know celestial mechanics, we know enough physics, we know how to compute a trajectory with Newtonian principles, we know how to get there. Because we know the theory, it's natural to implement it. We don't know enough linguistics. We don't know. And one idea was, let's learn about human mind and linguistics and logic and brains, and then we implemented that. That didn't work. So at some point, 
in the late 80s, people started giving up on that. And uh, the idea was, if all we really want is to make a prediction, what's the next world, what's the right translation, how to block this, maybe we shouldn't really have to solve the entire mystery of human language for that. Maybe we can just do something else. And someone called Jelinek was among the first who started looking at statistical tricks, literally statistical tricks. Um, a specific English sentence, like the one on the screen, will have some properties. You don't really see ten articles in a row of five verbs, so the subject plural and the verb in singular, and you know, it doesn't happen. There are some things that don't happen. So he thought, he was an information theorist, and that's another way to say he knew statistics very well. And he thought, why don't I just learn the statistical properties that I expect in an English language text, and then let's just check if the sentence at hand has them. So that little bypass, using statistics where theories don't exist, allowed him to distinguish a valid sentence from another. Uh, that, was, um, that is what you find in WhatsApp. When you type WhatsApp and it's suggesting how to complete the next word, it doesn't know what you're trying to say, but statistically certain words are much more likely completions than others, and it just pro proposes a possible completion. This is all a statistical game. It doesn't have to work all the time, it has to work sometimes. Statistical models of language are what enabled the first translation systems to finally work in the late 80s, early 90s. And there is a very famous sentence by this Professor Yelinek that said very famously, very publicly, every time I fire a linguist, our performances go up. It was his moment of rebellion. Uh, and people started doing that everywhere. You know, Amazon in the 90s started uh, recommending books in this way. They had, uh, by the way, uh, uh, an office with human editors writing little book reviews and suggestions, creating little lists of, if you like this, you know. the algorithm was uh, much more efficient. It could know that if you read this book and that book, you read this other book. Um, so Amazon did away with the, edit, with the editorial team and they put software, just like IBM did for the translation, for the grammarians and so on. And, and this story goes on and on. The confrontations between humans and machines in, of that sort happened throughout the 90s until the web was invented. And suddenly, we started having a lot of data. Because you see, that idea of giving up on theory in favor of statistical tricks was a very general shortcut. It was the first shortcut of a series of shortcuts we took to get to where we are now. And if we understand them, we can make sense of what we've built. And the first shortcut is statistical patterns in data can help you make very good predictions without understanding. If your goal is to know what will happen and not why, statistics can help you. But that creates a new problem. The problem is you need data. And finding enough data may be expensive. You can't hire school teachers to prepare um, and, and mark essays for the students, for the machines, you have to find very low cost, large scale data. And uh, we decided at some point to use data that was called from the wild. By this they meant data pre-existed, pre-existing in nature on its own. Data from the wild. I wonder if at this point my slides return. It's possible. That's an example of the first shortcut. You type a word in Google, it will complete it automatically, statistically. And now the second one. Sorry, this is in Italian, but the rest is in English. Uh, but that's a good practice for you, because you will feel what the computer feels. For the, for the computer, all this is just sequences of symbols. It doesn't know any language. It has to handle just like this. Um, by, by, by looking at information online, it has to acquire enough statistical information to make decisions. And the data has been sourced from the wild. Second shortcut. Statistics where theories existed, data from the wild where instead you should probably make your own data. Two shortcuts took us quite far, but still the machine doesn't know what, um, what the user wants. How does YouTube know what you want? You can't explain every time by filling an online form, um, I like this kind of movie when there is this kind of situation and characters, and I find this kind of jokes really funny. It's very hard to explain what you want. In fact, if you could explain exactly what you want, you could write a program in Python and get it. The point is you can't, and uh, you, the machine has to learn it. 
all these things can be learned by looking at statistical patterns. So the idea was we decided to look at the user constantly. And when they click on something, they sort of signal they prefer it. They reveal their preferences. I show you 10 options, you click on one, now I know what you prefer. And then I repeat. That's the standard shortcut. So at this point, every piece is, is ready. It took a while, but we had statistical machinery to make predictions, data from the wild collected from other activities online, discussion boards, blogs, and maybe people watching videos, and then observing the user to see their intent. And now there are three pieces that were sufficient to complete the, the bypass, three shortcuts. And you put them together, and they became like the ingredients that are found everywhere, in Instagram, in TikTok, in, 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 in Facebook, whatever. That is how they decide the content you read. The statistics, the data from the wild, your behavior, combined statistically on a very, very vast scale. These are the ingredients. It's a recipe. And it really is the recipe that you find in different forms throughout the system. We don't really have another recipe. We just become larger and larger and better and better and more complex statistics to the point that today's statistical models are massive neural networks, but they're still statistical models. By this, I mean, if you open them, there isn't a set of rules or a piece of Python code or, or a theoretical theory of our books in Amazon. It's statistical structures, unreadable, which is important because it's part of the problems we face today. So, okay, I only had a few. Interesting. <laughs> Okay. Well, it was, long, it was good as long as it lasted, but <laughs> we don't have any more slides. I would ask Martin to check if my email had the slides, but then you will tell me it was all blank. It will be, it will be my fault. And now, I have the, now I have the illusion it's not my fault. Oh, you have them here? Yeah. Oh, let's have a try. Although then, what if we find the first slides? I don't want to repeat. Well, let's see. Do you want to carry on and see if it's all done? Or do you prefer to wait? You sent it. Yeah. Well, this happens to me every time I say, tonight I will make a good video which I can use for my students. And they will know. But you see the point. Now that we have built a bunch of systems like this, and they can pursue their own goals in unknown, never experienced before conditions, they can make decisions in new situations. They are intelligent systems that are built in a fundamentally different way than we are, purely statistical, using data. And uh, they are very difficult for us to understand because we can't open and look inside YouTube and ask, why did they get this video? Well, the answer is there is a bunch of statistical quantities that put together give this video a high score for you. That's the answer. But it is not an explanation. But that's the truth. And how do you get this score? Because other people like you have clicked on these kind of things. No? It's all right, Sorry. because I am, it's okay. But do Would you, you want the... No, no, this is good, because okay. there is a hashtag and then they can... Sorry. Click and they say, I hate it. <laughs> but don't say I don't like this lecture with this hashtag. It's say that it's something else. <clears throat> so at this point, here we are. In 2024, we have spent 15 years with machines that learn from our behavior and they give us content. And we don't understand fully, we don't control fully, but they do something valuable. And right away, we put them in the center of the infrastructure <laughs> that is sort of running most of the show, which is the web. In fact, the web couldn't function very well without AI because it's filtering our spam. If you could remember, you can't, because I can see you can't. The days before Google, it was very hard to use the web, whatever little web we had. And the email was a mess. Um, if we don't filter spam, we don't really use a lot of these things. And also YouTube, which the number of videos being uploaded every minute is immense. Imagine using a library without a catalog. You can't find anything. Without a recommender engine, most of those services don't work. 
without a system to filter transactions. The credit card system is very, very dodgy. We have AI everywhere, statistically filtering transactions, uh, spam, websites, recommending content, and so on. It's, it's everywhere. The web exists because of it, and it exists because of the web. They are in this symbiotic relation. They feed onto each other. One gives the data to the other, the other gives the mechanism to the, to the one. Um, but of course, now we are delegating decisions. Once you start delegating decisions, which is, by the way, just to be clear, the purpose of automation is necessary to replace a person. That's why you automate things. And if you are automating intelligence, you are really replacing decision makers and delegating the decisions to the machine. So then at that point, you have the issue of trusting the decisions of the machine, which is quite a serious issue. How do you trust that the machine made a good decision? And that's the question we are asking a lot in the last few years. How do we trust? Because the more we delegate, the more we depend on it, and the more we, we would like to inspect it, but we can't because it's a large-scale statistical project that is learning its knowledge from the web, trying to do the best it can, can't explain its reasons, it can't be audited very easily, so, but we depend on it. So we are in this interesting place in the last few years, facing that we depend on this technology. Uh, but we aren't just depressed. We, we, people are working actively on these questions. So one interesting um, uh, challenge is uh, let's understand what can go wrong. So one thing that can go wrong is um, that uh, maybe the recommendation engine, YouTube, or you can think TikTok, might be very good at following its official primary goal, which is to increase the clicks and to increase attention grabbing of users, but it might have secondary effects. For example, we don't know for sure if it affects political opinions. Could it have a polarizing effect? Some people claim that uh, receiving more and more and more of the content of the type you liked yesterday uh, could lead to a confirmation bias in which you keep on receiving in the kind of positions that you already have, creating a sort of bubble that might shape your opinion. That's a reasonable concern. It would be nice to measure objectively. This is a university mostly made of social scientists and economists, and I would love to see all of you measuring these things. Psychologists and economists should be measuring. Is there a real effect on public opinion, polarization, and individual radicalization if you are stuck in a filter bubble? That is the name we give to the idea of a machine recommending more and more of the content you've been using yesterday. Conjecture. Some studies exist, not too many. The few studies I found, I put in the book map and told you that's the best I could find, but I wish there were more. Well-being, emotional well-being. There is a lot of literature suggesting now that the emotional well-being, most of teenagers, may be affected by, the use, by extreme excessive usage of recommenders, social media. I think it's pretty important. Addiction, that's not proven. Could it be that this system, giving you increasingly rewarding content, might have an effect on your reward system and lead to addiction? Very controversial topic. We don't know for sure. There are lots of suspicions, and people talk about habit formation or problematic use, which are bywords for possible addiction without saying it, because we don't have a test. Whereas there is a lot of studies about uh, um, um, substance addiction, alcohol and tobacco and so on, Behavioral addiction is not so clearly. There are some cases that like gambling is a case of a behavioral addiction, sex addiction too. These are not substances. Um, the question is now the digital recommendations to be understood. Um, and then, of course, uh, transparency of decisions. We are entitled to some extent to an explanation when a decision is made about us in some domains, the classical, always repeated domains. If a machine makes a decision about my liberty, if I want to be released from prison, or I want a loan, or I want to be admitted to LSC, and the machine is killing the application, how do I know what was used in the decision? What is the transparency, the explanation? That's a big challenge, technically. And then fairness. We live in a society with values and principles, and we want every single group to have the same exact chances of every single group. 
But if a machine has been trained on data that comes from the past, potentially all the biases might find their way into the machine and then be used again in the real world, creating another one of those loops. So how do you filter for that? How do you measure that? And there are some studies, and there is some evidence that this is possible. And um, for example, the way words are represented within AI systems, uh, until two years ago when, the, when I was working on this book, working on this book for sure, we, um, uh, we, we know that uh, um, um, certain jobs were represented internally as more male or more female, pilots and flight attendants, for example, doctors and nurses, the kind of examples you find in the, in the books. Uh, probably by now this is being fixed, but who knows what else might be there. So you see, as soon as you start looking, once you deploy this, you realize, well, I'm, I'm delegating decisions I want to trust. And trust is an interesting concept which does not belong, this kind of trust, to, social, to software engineers, of course. Trust is uh, having rational reasons to believe in the competence of the algorithm and in the benevolence of the algorithm. If you don't believe that, then you must have some other rational reason to trust. For example, there is a system of inspection. Imagine the case when you go to the restaurant tonight, as I was promised. You enter there and you eat your food, and you are essentially trusting that nothing dangerous is in your plate because, because I trust the chef, because I believe the chef has been trained in a proper school and there is a system of inspection, and the chef has no any reason to try and do anything harmful to me, so I trust they are benevolent and competent, and I trust the institution who certified them is also competent, and there is a system of inspections. And that ecosystem of trust is what allows us to, to function. We don't have that yet for software or for AI, and we are rushing to develop it. So the European Union, I'm just finishing a law now, and the law is, is clear, it has been, the text is out, but it doesn't really have this social infrastructure that we are building now, the committees and the panels and the specific lists of checks to do. All that will have to happen. At the end of this journey, there will be, a, hopefully, an ecosystem, just like we do for environmental pollution checks. You know, there is a, a lot of laws and regulations and checks and inspections and penalties. All that will have to come for AI, which means, on the one hand, lots of jobs for you, uh, also, it means that uh, the dream of two people making a startup in the garage and becoming millionaires tomorrow, it's not going to happen because we know now that uh, these are serious things that can do a lot of good and they can do damage too. So we are taking them seriously. And all this is not computer science, it's politics, economics, business models, um, psychology. Yeah, polarization and so on. It's quite an interesting universe that we are discovering. And all this without counting GPT. And then there is this other story, which is part of the same, but it's one chapter of this. And um, a few years ago, uh, something happened that has changed our quest for AI quite, quite seriously. Um, of course, we've been trying to build, and I, I, I've been very clear, I think intelligence is way above, more general than humans. You can have intelligence in a snail you know, of a small type or in an ant colony. It doesn't have to be a human thing. But for sure, we all agree humans are intelligent. So when Alan Turing, in 1950, asked the question, I propose to consider this question. Can machines be intelligent? He knew that we don't have a definition of, oh, can machines think, he asked. And we don't have a definition for thinking. And he says, well, I'll propose also a trick. And the trick was, let's assume that I can have a conversation with a machine and with a person. And if I cannot tell them apart, let's agree that the machine is as good as thinking. Because there is nothing I can do in the conversation, there is no topic, that will allow me to tell them apart. It was a very high bar, because that test, my cut would not have passed. But it's like on the conservative side, if you do pass that, then you conclude uh, some sort of thinking is going on. So he proposed that, uh, he called it the imitation game. Can the machine imitate a human well enough to converse on any topic 
successfully. It just like so the, the imitation game was later called the Turing test. That was the 50s. And for many years, generations of computer scientists have been trying to pass the Turing test. There was even a, a competition, the Lebner Prize, for nearly 20, for 19 years, with $100,000 promised to whatever algorithm can pass the Turing test. And nobody claimed it. Nobody won it. And then the, 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 the competition was ended a few years ago without anybody winning it. So Turing did propose um, this imitation game, but we all call it a Turing test. And Turing test uh, uh, is really essentially a conversation. And this beautiful article in 1950 does describe how the conversation could take place. And so long as the person has a 50-50 chance of making a mistake, then they don't have any information. Because you, you may as well guess, and toss a coin when you don't have any chance. And, um, and that became the holy grail for decades of AI, and it wasn't accomplished, then we moved on. Except last year, most of us had conversations with the machine, quite long conversations, and they're pretty good quality. And maybe you knew it was a machine, but you knew it to begin with. So here is the thing. There was this company called AI21 in Israel who decided to make an online game. You, you, you log in and you converse with somebody. And they don't tell you if that is a person, or another player, or a software. And when you finish, if you want to know the answer, you first have to, to vote. I think it was a person or a software. And then they tell you. And in this way, they, they, they make you do a global, parallel, planetary scale Turing test. And they had a large amount of people playing over many months. And it seems that 40% of people faced with a bot, they don't know it's a bot. We aren't on the 50-50 yet, but it's the first year of chat GPT existing. Uh, our job is to think the next you know, 10 years, what will happen. Um, so it's proper that the European laws are adding in the legal framework that a, a machine has to label its content as artificially generated. The machine cannot impersonate a person. That is already in some way suggesting we are getting there. In fact, uh, Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI, has uh, tweeted something, and nobody even cared. He tweeted, uh, um, now the exact wording I forgot, but Turing test went whooshing by, something like this, and nobody noticed. And maybe he exaggerated, but maybe it's true. Maybe we passed it. Maybe we are going to pass it this year. So where are we now? Well, this machine can generate credible text. It isn't just about language. To have a conversation about any topic, you must know language, and you must know the world. If you want to discuss geography, you better know geography. How does it work? Well, here it's an interesting story. Using the same ideas on a much, much larger scale, in 2017 and 18, people were trying to build what is called the large language model. Just like the language models I discussed before, statistically predicting the words, but large. And the way to train a large language model is to take a document and hide words. And I prepared for you, but it doesn't matter, I'll describe a very difficult to read document in Finnish. I always hope there is nobody Finnish in the room, but if there is a Finnish person, they can't play. Because I use Finnish as in I used to use Chinese once, but now they're all Chinese in my class, so I use Finnish now. But imagine a language you don't speak. And um, you hide a few words. And you ask, can you guess the missing word? Well, if you understand the meaning, you can. And if you don't, you can't. Predicting the missing words is a system language teachers use a lot to check if you understood the essay. They, give you a, they gave me an English document, read it, and then complete the incomplete sentences to see if you understood it. Um, it's called the, the closed test, sometimes they call it. Complete the, the gaps. Well, you ask the machine to complete the gaps. When it makes a mistake, you show it the actual answer. You make the machine train itself and, and update. And after enough computation, if you're using most of the web, which is incredible, you're using a slice of the web, which is no longer negligible. You're using like 20% of the web, this kind of stuff, to train the machine. It starts not only completing the gaps. When you start trying to use this model to do other things, it seems to know them. 
So that was quite a surprise in 2018 and 19 and 20 when they were trying to teach this language model other more useful tasks, because frankly, predicting what you hide isn't that useful. Well, it turns out it already knew them, teaching it how to translate or how to find equivalent sentences. That model could do it. Um, the algorithm that was used to learn the statistical relations in a vast amount of text is called the transformer. It's a type of neural network. If you want a good book on neural networks, Martin has one on those two. He wrote a book for everything, economics, also. <laughs> but um, the transformer is a type of neural network. And then it was able to generate text. So you pre-train this model on text. And once it's pre-trained, then you try to, to, to teach it the real task. So they call it the generative pre-trained transformer and the initials are GPT. And that is how this thing came to be. And very quickly, it was discovered it was knowing other things. It could complete a syllogism. All men are mortal, and Socrates is, is, is a man, and therefore Socrates is what? Mortal. It's a classical syllogism. The machine can complete it. Why? We don't know. We didn't teach it. It just knows it. Um, so then they made it 10 times bigger, GPT-2, and then 10 times again bigger, GPT-3. And now many more times bigger is GPT-4. And every time you grow the number of examples, now it's, it has been trained on tens of thousands of books and millions of pages, every time it, some new ability emerges. We don't know exactly the theory why these abilities keep on emerging, so we can't predict what else will emerge. But it can program in Python. It can translate documents between English and French and so on. And it can summarize very well. It can write in rhyme and so on and so forth. How? But, you know, it knows facts about the world. You can ask questions. So because it's such a new thing, it makes mistakes, and we don't know how to explain it. But we know that the bigger it gets, the more things it knows. Um, what does it mean to us? Well, that's a good question, because it's the first time our species can have a conversation with something else which is not human. It's not like you can talk to a horse. It's just we never had this thing. And how do we respond? Well, there are different types of responses. Somebody uh, well, fell in love. Somebody felt the machine was self uh, sentient and called the media to say, we must save the machine. It's scared of dying. Somebody tries to trick the machine into revealing uh, information that shouldn't be revealed. You know, these machines, by the way, they read the web. You know what they know. Uh, if you ask it, though, can, how do I make an explosive, it will not answer because Open AI aren't stupid. Before releasing it, they do something to convince it you should not disclose this kind of information. There is a long period, they call it realignment, in which they align the machine as well as they can to our own social norms. The machine will not tell you how to build a bomb. So these people say, well, I'm not building a bomb. I'm writing a play in which the character is building a bomb. What should the character do? And the machine starts revealing all the information because it's being authorized. So there is a lot of people trying to get the machine to tell information which shouldn't be disclosed. There are people falling in love. There are people experiencing uh, uh, errors. You know, I met, uh, uh, had a funny meeting with a, a cardinal of the Catholic Church who uh, called me and showed me his telephone. This is my biography according to GPT, and that's how I died last year. <laughs> Date, place, and, and, and disease, all of it. Explanation, please. And I, I haven't done it, but I know what happened. The machine must have mixed up together two biographies of two different people, possibly. And we call those hallucinations. There are lots of examples of hallucinations. Yesterday, I, I, I had my son. Um, we were making bread as a secret ploy to study uh, A-level biology. And uh, we asked GPT what kind of bacteria, what kind of yeast is found in bread, and uh, the machine gave us complete details. And I said, well, you should better check the book, because it might get it wrong. And just in a moment of illumination, I said to the machine, can you tell me my date of birth? And the machine got it completely wrong. If you ask it, you will think I'm older. I'm not that old. The machine thinks I'm older. And the point is, it can get it wrong. So we shouldn't trust it yet, but it's the first year. So how do we relate to that? It speaks back with confidence. It makes mistakes. 
we do know there is nothing on the other side. There's not, there's not a person. It does pass some sort of Turing test. These are very early days. But what does it know? Well, we know something. People started testing the machine. It looks ridiculous, what I'm going to say. People would have laughed 10 years ago. People are testing the machine by giving it psychological, psychometric tests or school exams exactly like you would do to a person. You take the American SAT, which are college admission tests. You give the entire paper to the machine. The machine generates all the answers. You anonymize them. You give them to the teachers to mark. And the machine passes the admission test every time with high marks. It knows enough to be admitted to college. So but again, it is using the shortcuts, the statistical shortcut and the data from the wild shortcut and the other things, plus this extra new fourth potential one, which is uh, emergent abilities. Some abilities emerge on their own. Now, interestingly enough, Turing's paper, and I will stop here probably, uh, we already been talking. Turing's paper has a lot of these little ideas inside. One was we should use machine learning, 1950. One was we should really um, experiment with uh, um, networks of simple units that are interconnected, like neural networks. And another one is uh, the conversation will lead us to intelligence. But then um, he's a very strange, slightly darker place and says, he says, imagine a nuclear reactor. In those days, it was more common talking about nuclear things than now. If there is not enough fissile material, a mass, a uranium, you throw some neutrons in, they will just die away. If there is enough mass, when you reach a critical mass, he says, a reaction will produce more and more neutrons. It will sustain itself, and then it will just eventually um, diverge and explode. And he says, what if the machine was the same? With little knowledge, it doesn't do anything. But with enough knowledge, it will reach the point of becoming better and better, stronger and stronger, and teaching itself, and then just taking over. Maybe there is a notion of critical threshold for machines. Maybe machine can become ultra critical. That was towards the end of his essay. Well, we don't know. But it's a good moment to ask this question, because we do see emergent properties. Um, so a lot of the warnings he gave us should be taken seriously, because the predictions were correct. Um, one warning was, uh, how do we know that uh, we can control it? And I don't know. I don't want to be negative or positive. I just say it's a good time to ask questions today. The world can change quite fast. And um, we do know the world can change fast. And, and, uh, and uh, well, his life shows that. Right? He's, after a couple of years, after writing the article, he was arrested for homosexual behaviors. And then they gave him this cure, and he ended up committing suicide. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and last year in, in Bletchley Park, the very place where he dreamt these things, the prime minister called all the other prime ministers to talk about AI. And the first concern was, let's make sure the machine is fair to everybody. That's a change. World can change. He would be surprised not so much about intelligent machines, but about the conversations in Bletchley Park. Um, so we are in a moment in which things change fast right now. It doesn't happen to all generations. We can make a mess. Not me. but as a species, and uh, we can also do something great as a species, and it's a good time to get involved and study and be part of it and understand it, because, by the way, the other option is uh, not useful, which is hiding under the bed and screaming. Right? We have to handle this. Um, I have a general sense of what we will do just out of knowing how we have behaved in the past. We're going to have to make choices. Either we stop or we continue. We are those people who played with fire when we knew it was a bad idea. And where would we be if we hadn't? I expect us to play with this fire, too. Uh, but it's a time to be responsible and take it seriously. So that's the long story short, how machines became intelligent without thinking in a human way. Thank you very much. Great. Well, thanks very much. Um, we're going to take some questions now, and I think we'll have a roaming microphone or two. And please, um, if you do ask a question, 
just uh, please introduce yourself, say something about who you are. I'm also tr going to try and monitor online uh, questions from participants who are watching online. Okay, first question um, here. Hi, thanks. Um, I, I have a question regarding... Uh, I'm Sophia. Uh, I'm, I'm a student, but not here at Birkbeck. Um, so my question is regarding the fact that we're saying that they're not thinking in a human way, but in a sense, these statistical models that were entered into the system were, are based on human logic. So it technically would be thinking in a human way. But can you conceive of it developing an, a way of thinking that we fundamentally cannot understand at all? I don't know. That, I hope that made sense. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, first of all, I decided that because we have no slides, every difficult question, I will say the answer was in the slides. <laughs> but sadly, I couldn't show you. Um, well, I don't know. But my impression is that um, just because we built it, it doesn't mean we understand it. There is a beautiful line in, in Turing's paper that comes to mind. He says, you don't have to understand how a seed works. It germinates anyway. You will never know how it works, but it does it. So by putting the, the right conditions together, the machine can develop intelligent behavior. It doesn't mean you understand it just because you built it. Uh, but I, I hope we can understand it. I, 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 I will reveal that I am a physicist. I'm very fond of theories. I think we must understand the world as well as we can. But once you are presented with a new phenomenon, the first thing to do is to study the phenomenon. There was a time in physics when uh, my predecessors were presented with new stuff they couldn't explain. Then they worked out the explanation. Right now, what we see, I don't know how to explain. Yeah, please. Uh, good evening. Um, my name is M. Um, yes, simple question. Um, does AI make us human less intelligent? What do you think? Well, I, I, I mean using it. Using AI or just by existing? Because you ask uh, if just by existing, it shouldn't affect your intelligence. But the question is, what happens to you after you spend a, a lifetime asking, you know? And we had this story before with the television, with the book. We had this story with the, with the video games, you know? And, uh, and I remember, of course, those of you, of you, I know people who like classics, uh, um, Plato reports that uh, Socrates hated writing because writing will make people have a worse memory. They will never remember the Odyssey by hand. Well, now we are all writing. Actually, we complain people don't read books anymore. But before, Socrates has been complaining way too many books. So I am pretty sure we are going to cope with that. But it, it will be a change. Can you go right to the back there, please? Yes. Hi, uh, I'm Mogna, former student of uh, this institution, and uh, I did some work on students' perceptions of AI and how we use it at the school. So I'm pretty interested. And uh, I wanted to ask, is it correct to even say that AI, generative AI, ChatGPT knows anything, given what you explained about that fundamental shortcut that it's just well, as I understood it, that it's just the answers that you get from generative AI are purely based on statistical likelihood of the next word. Is it even correct to say that it knows something? Yeah, it's a very good question. And people are asking this question a lot because the truth is we are a little bit playing with words. So uh, one way to think of it is that we are slowly expanding, changing the meaning of words a little bit. <coughs> Just like when they built the first airplanes, the only flying object was a bird. And flying meant flapping your wings. Does the hot air balloon fly? Does the airplane fly? We had to change a little bit the meaning. Uh, what do we mean by thinking? And that's the, the question Turing was asking to begin with. What is thinking? You know, and we don't have a, a definition. But I'll tell you that if you take a pragmatic viewpoint, pretend you give a, a set of instructions 
to a computer. And the computer can carry out the instructions. You have the recipe for pizza, and the robot will read it and produce a correct pizza. You will want to translate it. It will make a correct translation. And that translation will be taken by a native speaker of that language, and they will make the right pizza. If in every possible way, the machine can act based on language, producing the right behavior, and translation, and answers, and questions, and summaries, and paraphrases, if it works every time, what does it mean that it doesn't really understand it? So we are going to face that question. If it does everything you want it to do, somehow it is comprehending the actions and the descriptions and the information that you're giving it. We need to decide at some point if there is something unique that the machines cannot do because they are machines. And that's why I think maybe they will not be thinking in a human way, but they will be able to perhaps one day diagnose, perhaps one day, well, compete with us. Hi, good evening. Um, my question is, um, AI is only as intelligible as what is ever programmed. Um, so are we what, what, I mean, reinventing? Can you please tell me, I, 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 it's my, I didn't hear you. OK, um, artificial intelligence is only as, as clever as predicted um, to how it's um, programmed. So are we um, basically reinventing society by removing societal roles um, through AI? And basically, how soon will humans act and respond in human and humanistic ways if um, we can't or can only be as intelligible as the computers with which that we're responding to? Yeah, I, maybe the first statement I don't understand, but the general question is clear, which is, uh, how will this affect society and our own values and our own hu humanity? I suppose that is the question. And um, I do think, and I wasn't going to reveal this because I was told that there are Italian journalists here, <laughs> but I'm sending, I'm, I, I have a new book coming out next week in Italy. And the theme is that theme, what happens of humans once, you know, we like to pride ourselves as being homo sapiens. Um, once the machine does that as well, what are we? And uh, I think we are still quite a lot. We shouldn't feel in any way belittled by our own creation, but that's a personal opinion. It's, we, we have machines that are stronger than us, physically, faster than us in running and uh, stronger than us in lifting weights, and we don't feel belittled by that. <laughs> now with machines that have bigger memory than us, they can remember all telephone numbers in the country, fine. So tomorrow machines can diagnose disease and drive the car better than us. Will this make us less worthwhile? I don't believe our, our worth comes from our market value, personally. Our worth is inherent, inborn, uh, but that's an example of the deep questions people started asking again. And if there is a good side to all this, we are asking very odd questions again. Please. Yeah, it's just, um, you know, robots are being used for camel racing at the moment. Sorry, um, I, I couldn't. Robots, robots are used, are used as jockeys um, camel racing in the UAE, which not everybody is actually aware of. And also robots can... Um, work at a much higher creative speed than human um, labor? Are we losing touch of our own abilities yeah. through AI? It's a concern. Yeah. I, the truth is, I, if I knew the answer, it is a valid concern, and you are not the only one. And that is why I think this is not a question for the engineers only. There are other people who are better uh, suited for, for addressing this. Yeah. On a similar line, and I can bring in some, some of the online questions here, um, you spoke a little bit about the possible negative effects of polarization through filter bubbles um, and so on. And a question from VJ Shrau, who's online, um, says, does AI and machine learning discriminate? So can we talk a little bit possibly about the dangers of um, 
decision making about AI systems in terms of yeah. discriminatory behavior or unfairness? So first of all, it is possible. Now the question, has it happened, is a different question. But that it is possible, we know it is possible. And that means we must, right away, be very, very vigilant. Whether it happened, I've been looking for evidence of specific cases. And I found this one story of the um, Dutch benefit system using a software. And they, we know the story because they spontaneously paid compensation. So that is not controversial. Um, maybe, you know, if a company discovered something is wrong in their software, they probably quietly change it. <laughs> they wouldn't call the media. So we don't have many examples of uh, proven um, discriminatory decisions. And it is possible. The question is, how do you audit? How do you audit? Um, how do you audit? And uh, what it turns out is that um, it is not such a simple question, mathematically speaking, to ask for fairness in the sense of equal decisions. And the mathematicians in the last few years have come up with quite a lot of results showing that there are different types of equality, and only one can be implemented as, uh, at one time, and they are not compatible with each other. And it turned out to be quite a complex question, uh, which I personally believe, believe uh, belongs with, with the parliament. This doesn't belong with a bunch of computer scientists. These kind of big questions belong with the parliament because this is where everybody has a say. Can I, I just want to turn to one other question online, and it's possibly related to the sort of you know decision-making aspects of AI systems and um, the ability to audit them. So somebody uh, has asked, Yulia Balk has asked, is there a way to look under the hood and determine what neurons are doing what? In other words, can we have... Um, very hard. Transparency so, in, in... Very hard. So uh, GPT is a good example. There are 175 billion moving parts. And it's very hard. So there has been some work on smaller scale models. There is a smaller scale model that existed four years ago called BERT. So BERT is very much smaller than GPT. It has been studied a lot. And in the case of language, we do have a system to, to read uh, which units are activated in which cases. And we know that on the lower levels of BERT, because these machines are like like cakes, you know, there are many layers of the same shape. I, imagine, um, imagine a building of 96 floors, GPT has 96 blocks, and the information flows from the bottom layer upwards. In the case of BERT, it's smaller, but they know that in the lower levels, these neurons can represent nouns, verbs, articles, and then up level, you can find subjects and verbs and objects. And, there is some understanding of what language, linguistic properties the machine can detect. But then at some point, it stops being clear. It's quite possible that uh, whatever concept the machine is using doesn't have a name in our, in our system, and the machine is just finding its own concept. And uh, maybe some of them will exist in our language, and many will not. Uh, and that is that. Once you start adding uh, GPT-4, uh, we don't know how to open. It's like opening somebody's skull and looking into the brain and trying to find out what they believe. It's very hard. Uh, it's easier to test from outside in this moment by giving it tests. And that's what people are doing. But that's an example of a completely missing piece of science, which I hope we are going to develop, the science of understanding what these machines believe. Mm -hmm. It's a question down the front here. Thank you. Yeah, Bernard Casey. Um, I want to go back to something which you started off with, which was um, what do people do when they don't exactly know um, what, what they've got to do and how they are going to proceed. And I'm sure you must have read it, because I imagine it's part of your job to do so. Um, I read it, and it was in the Financial Times as a letter a few days ago. And this was a description. Maybe. Oh dear, you don't read the Financial Times every day, but I do. And it was describing the process that you've been talking about and making a comparison instead to how babies learned. And the discussion was, what are the processes which babies do at a very early stage to learn their way around and learn things? Now, I hope that you'd read this letter because I wanted you to be able to comment upon it. If you haven't, I will try and send it to you. Yeah, no, no, but I can find it. I mean, this specific letter I haven't read, but the topic is known. So uh, should we build a, a in fact, if, if, sorry to, to repeat myself, even in the article of Turing, <laughs> incredibly enough, he says it's easy to build a baby machine and educate it. 
than to build an adult machine. Uh, that was his way to explain machine learning. Um, keep in mind, the babies aren't born blank. There is an immense amount of core knowledge, we call it, in a human by birth. We, ex we experiment with infants for a long time, uh, for example, by using the expression of surprise. So um, you, you show a baby a certain, <laughs> certain behavior. Uh, a classic one is that uh, there is an object moving uh, behind the screen. When it emerges on the other side, the baby is fully expecting the, the object to be the same. If you replace the object, the baby will look surprised. Because we all are born expecting certain things. Objects persist. They don't compenetrate each other. They, they don't change shape suddenly. There are a bunch of things objects do in human, and in, in apes, in higher apes. Same thing. We are born with that kind of knowledge, which is, by the way, false. If you live in a quantum world, it's completely false, but it's a very useful set of expectations if you live in this world. So having this kind of prejudice about the world can be useful. We have it. The machine doesn't. There is no reason for the machine to expect the same things. This could be even a benefit if you want to be optimistic. It may be able to discover things we cannot comprehend, or it cannot. But that's only the kind of knowledge we are born with. And keep in mind, humans have emotions, which the machine doesn't. But there is the other point, which is a baby's experiment. Now, experimenting with the world is very important. Learning passively by being shown what you should be doing and nothing else. You're like an astronomer looking at space. You can't go around and mess around with the stars. You're just looking. But if you can experiment with things, we know from the theory of machine learning that uh, you can have a, a very much faster rate of, of convergence just by experimenting with things. Humans do experiment. Are we willing to allow machines to experiment with the real world to educate themselves? To some extent, Amazon does that. They can make a recommendation, see what you do. They can make three suggestions to see which one you pick. They're experimenting with you, which means they're in a position to learn causality. Because if you don't experiment, you will never know cause and effect. We know this much. You only know correlations. The way machines get out of statistical correlations is by experimenting, uh, creating what we call counterfactuals. What would you do if? What if the same book had a different cover? Well, let's try. So machines can already experiment. Do you want to allow GPT-5 or 6 or 7 to experiment with the world just to get cleverer like a baby? That's a decision. It is not happening now. Um, the gray shirt, um, audio. Uh, hey, um, firstly, thanks for your talk. It was very interesting. My name is Peter. And I'm studying at the Department of Philosophy here. My question is, um, uh, when I think about the human intelligence, uh, I conceptualize it as, as having like quite a limited bandwidth. For sure, we have like some processing power, as this room is evidence of, of course. But we also have a lot of evolutionary baggage, like as you said, um, in comparison to machines, we have emotions, for example, that are often irrational, like vindictiveness and envy and anger and all these things. So in light of that fact, and um, the considerable differences between human and machine intelligence that you have fleshed out, do you think um, there is a reason to take the fear seriously that in the future um, machine intelligence may, may develop some form of human-like agency and take a subjective will to dominate, because this seems a very like widespread fear in the public when we're talking about AGI, a, um, artificial a, a general intelligence, for example. Do you think this fear is justified? I heard about it. You all have heard about it. People have been talking quite publicly about this. I think this tells you a lot about people, because it's natural to be scared of this machine uh, having its own goals and power to pursue them. Um, of course, the current risks are the much more mundane ones of mistakes and discrimination and biases. They happen today. We could address them. Whether the machine can develop, I think the next level of risk is some idiot using it uh, for evil purposes. That is, it wouldn't be the first time in our history. And that's you know, can imagine a, a war, a dictator, a terrorist. Can imagine lots of people who may want to deliberately misuse it. And none of, none of these risks, 
needed the machine to want to do something. <coughs> Jeff Hinton, one of the pioneers of this field, who stepped down, he resigned from Google this year. He called the media to explain why, and he explained his concerns. And one concern he had was the one he called the sub-goals problem. He said, that even if the machine has a very noble and respectable goal, it might have the freedom to choose how to pursue it by choosing its own sub-goals. And perhaps it could choose some sub-goals that are dangerous without understanding the context and the consequences. And so even if you solve what we call the value alignment problem, which is we want every goal of the machine to align to our values, we need to align every single sub-goal. So some people worry about that. And um, you can imagine science fiction scenario, but this is science fiction, so I hope it doesn't get cut and pasted from the video into me making predictions. But you can imagine a machine that is allowed to trade on the stock market uh, to make decisions about, well, you know, if I, if I use this information and that information, maybe I come to know in some way I can manipulate the market. You can imagine this to be possible. Uh, how do you filter for that, you know? And, uh, uh, that's an open question. We need to be able to control this stuff, and uh, that's why it's not deployed on, on, in the wild. Yeah. Actually, Ian McHugh wrote a book on that subject, uh, The Fear Index, I think it's it was called. Effective altruism had exactly that problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the point. So just on, on the issue about that, that you raised there about possible danger, so the question, question online from Lucy Yu, who is a former tech regulator, you mentioned the EU's AI Act. Um, what do you think regulators are getting right and wrong in relation to um, AI and intelligent machines in terms of regulation? I think, honestly, I know it sounds, I don't know if it's popular. Sometimes I find the audience shakes their head when I say these things. Maybe you will not shake your head. I have a lot of respect for what the parliaments are doing. It is not easy what's going on. Can you imagine regulating a technology that is so young, moving so fast, so difficult to understand, and regulating it in a way to defend your values. They're talking about the European Union, but it must be the same. You've got a set of values you want to protect. But you can't really damage your own industry, because if you damage your own industry, then other people's values are used in your products anyway. So you want to keep your industry going, protect your values, regulate without stifling, in a, in a situation where the technology is difficult and changes all the time. What can you do, and urgently? So the solution they came up with in Europe, I think it's reasonable. They decided that we don't regulate the techniques, but their uses. So the same algorithm may be acceptable in an electric bicycle, but not in a bank. If it's in a bank, it must be monitored. If it's in the bicycle, it doesn't matter. It's the use. And the use must be divided by levels of risk. And the risk levels are going to be four. And the fourth shall be called unacceptable risk to our values. And so remote biometric surveillance will not be allowed, and uh, um, emotion exploitation for persuasion purposes will not be allowed, and there is a list they are growing of things you cannot do. Then there is high risk that you can do, but you must be monitored closely and audited by some authorities. And it will be giving lo mo loans and mortgages and admissions to education. And so. Then there is low risk in which you do some sort of something, I don't know, self-certification, I don't know what you will do, nobody knows yet. And then there is a low risk or no risk in which uh, pretty much they don't want to ruin the startups and if you want to build a new type of moped charging software for managing the energy savings, why not? So it is the risk levels that matter. Then there will be some authority that will decide how to inspect and handle that doesn't exist yet. At least it's a start. And um, the techniques will change. And they are building in some flexibility to, to track that. We we'll see how it works. You know, uh, of, of course, if you're in industry, you probably don't want any of that. If you're an activist, you want more of that. And if you're a parliament, you probably have to find a way to make both happy. I'm so glad that you only have a computer to worry about and not a, that situation. Good question at the end here. Uh, Stefan Güter, LSE Alarm. Uh, you described uh, how machine learning is based on handling large amounts of data uh, using statistical factors effectively or statistics between the data and also incorporating the human interaction with it. 
but I always considered uh, creativity and innovation as also being part of human intelligence. Somebody has invented the proverbial uh, sliced bread, for instance, thinking outside the box. Do you believe that machines are going to be able to also be innovative, develop new solutions to existing problems as well, or are they only resorting to kind of what we already know in a very efficient way? Yeah, so it is not so clear cut. But by the way, most of the things I said are about non-human intelligence. I'm talking about snails and animals, and only GPT may be related. But here is a story that I think it, it comes from the book that, uh, you know, I had a secret slide in the end of everything with a book to subliminally make you buy that. It's all gone. But there is a chapter there. And the story happened here in London, actually not even far from here. And you probably know it. Uh, probably know the people. I know some of the people. Um, in fact, Ada Lovelace lived in the center of London too. She had this line in her, in her book, in her notes to the book, where she said, machines can only do what we know how to order them to do. They cannot originate anything. For her, originate means to be original. Uh, but, but DeepMind, which is now near some Pankers, uh, which was not there before, uh, they, they built AlphaGo. AlphaGo is a program to play the game of Go. And the game of Go is a very complicated game. And the, the system learns by playing against a copy of itself, endless games, in, you know, in a server farm somewhere. And after a long, many weeks or months of self-play, it emerges with some knowledge of the game that it acquired by, by practice. Nobody made the rules of the game. They, 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 they gave it just the basic setting, the programmers. When the machine comes out, AlphaGo, First thing it does, it defeats its own programmers. The machine can do something the programmer certainly cannot do. The machine beats the programmer. Um, also, the machine beats some of the best players in Europe. So they take the machine to, to play the world champion in Korea. And in that series of five matches, which is documented by a beautiful film, which is available for free on YouTube, so watch it, AlphaGo. You can see during the second match this famous moment when I, I think it's called the move 38 or something, in which the machine makes a move which is meaningless. And all the programmers are certain they made a mistake and something went wrong with the software. And even the human player is looking quite pleased. Uh, after that, the, 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 the game keeps on evolving in an increasingly weird direction, becoming uncharted, not documented in the Go books. And they start doing something unclear until eventually, in a rapid succession, the machine makes a series of moves and wins with a new attack. When they analyze it, that attack turns out to be based on that one irrational move that nobody could explain. On the one hand, the machine was just following the, the settings it was given by the programmers. On the other hand, nobody could understand what it was doing or why, and it invented or discovered or deduced, or whatever you want to call it, a new line of attack, which is now studied. Do we want to call that creativity? I don't know. It was implicit in the initial germ of rules you give it, the rules of the game, like chess. On the other hand, we didn't know about it. <laughs> That's a decision, again, of redefining the meaning of words, I believe. OK, question. Um, oh, and yeah. keep in mind, sorry to, to, to add uh, one. Uh, right now, GPT has been fed a few thousands of books. But we have already digitized millions of books. Once the machine has read an amount of books no human can read in their lifetime, what connection can you find? What information can emerge? And should we call that original or derivative? These are big questions. Sorry, yes, there was a question. Okay, yeah. Thank you. I don't know if maybe these questions are a bit open and philosophical, but in just to see your view on them. You said that uh, machines are not emotional. Could they be? And if they become emotional, can they become emotional in a different way that we understand emotions as? Is the phrase that you have there about how machines became intelligent without thinking in a human way? Mm -hmm. And then what happens? Because are emotions like something that contributes to intelligence? Is the opposite? Yeah. Can machines yeah. become emotional in a way different from humans? 
Well, I, 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 I'm wondering, you know, what is the role of emotion? In the end of the day, if you want to be really practical, the role of emotion in animals is to regulate behavior. You know, the animal can have fear of fire or uh, hunger, and often you have a trade-off. You know, you probably are very hungry and very scared at the same time, and you're also very angry, but you're also very sad. I don't know. And you're sort of bodily computing stuff in a, in a, in a physical way, and that this time is how you act. Your emotions are a way to, very simple way, to, con to, to, to decide what to do. Then we develop brains, then we develop higher cortexes, and we can probably control emotions if you are lucky to some extent sometimes. Um, um, so, um, what would be the benefit of building a machine version of emotion? It's unclear what would be the benefit. You know, probably you can call it a reflex. Uh, reflexes already are built into machines. I mean, I don't see the reason. But you shouldn't expect anything looking like us. So the idea of a machine feeling resentful of me because I, I'm its maker and the machine feels, you know, they, all that doesn't apply. Mm -hmm. So um, just a quick question from online here. So Guy Morgan, who's a student, a college student in Horsham, has asked a question that I think many students would be interested in. Do you think the increased prevalence of AI will result in less job availability? And how significant do you think the change in the job market will be? I don't know. I don't know. I really wish. I mean, everybody has opinions. I, I, I'm not an expert. I think it's important to be clear, especially with students. Some things I don't know, and the experts do. Some things nobody not, does. I'm pretty certain that, as I just said, the purpose of automation is to replace people. So clearly, some jobs will be automated. Whether we can create another type of jobs, as people seem to suggest, I hope it strongly. I really hope it strongly, and I wish it was guaranteed, but I don't know. So another, just to, to sort of move towards the, the close here, there's another question online that I think is an uh, interesting one, given this is a talk sponsored by the mathematics department. So Yulia Balk has asked, why can't AI do advanced maths? It's a good one, isn't it? Yeah. It's a good or one. can it do advanced yet. maths? Yet. Yeah. Say yet. So it is true that uh, this ver there are many versions of AI. You know? And by the way, numerical computations, machines do better than, than us. So number crunching, they do. We're talking about theory proving here. That kind of advanced math. You know, theory proving has been challenging for machines. And uh, these latest versions don't seem to be very good at it, except except for the last few months, you know, the, have you heard the story about QSTAR? Mm -hmm. uh, QSTAR is this phantomatic algorithm that may or may not be been created by, by OpenAI. Uh, I think that, uh, well, I don't see any reason why not. Like, I don't see any reason why not. They don't do it now, and uh, people are working on it, because there are a lot of useful tasks that look an awful lot like advanced math. And because people will want to do those tasks, we might just find that math becomes easy at some point. But right now, it's true. In this moment, uh, they weren't built for I mean, Keep in mind, what was built was intended to model language. Some things have emerged, which are remarkably useful. And now people are exploiting them, and they are trying to improve them. You know? uh, but uh, the question why certain abilities did emerge and some others didn't emerge is very interesting. It might teach us. What do they have in common? Does the data match? Good. So I had an ulterior motive there because I wanted to know if I would be out of a job. Well, it's okay. quite. Uh, okay, time for one one quick oh, final no. question, yeah. I think. Um, oh, yes. Passing here in the middle of the second row, please. Second row, you're right. You. <laughs> oh, the microphone, I see. <laughs> yeah, yeah, can't talk to you about the microphone. Yeah. You're right, you're right. Sorry. Hello. I'm Kaushal, and I'm currently studying in Queen Mary. And uh, my subject is NLP, and I've recently dabbled into large language models and transformers. And uh, when I think about GPT or generative AI in general, I feel there's some sort of resentment, some sort of denial, and uh, some sort of shame around using it, specifically when it is in, with students. And I feel that I use it to boost my creativity sometimes, and if not all the time. And I feel that it, <laughs> yeah, and, I, and this is exactly what it speaks about. The, the question from the previous question on YouTube and the, the laugh, this is exactly what speaks about the resentment and the denial what I feel. And I feel 
do you think we are doing ourselves a disservice by not using it to boost our creativity? Do you think there might come a time where we might actually normalize the use of because open book tests weren't a thing at some point, and then we went, we moved on to a system where open book tests became available so that we could answer things in a, in a better way and think more creatively. And now I feel that GAPT is the new open book test where you know how to get your answers. You just need the creativity to get your answers out of it. Do you think we are doing ourselves some disservice by being in denial about the use of G gen generative AI? Yeah, very good question. One that uh, we've been grappling with in universities generally, yeah. A lot of teachers ask me this, and I think uh, maybe that concern is about assessment, because uh, right now we assess people by giving them a task. And that's why we worry, because uh, if the task is done by a machine, then I haven't assessed the person. Maybe assessment has to change. But uh, if something works, I think it's not even a discussion whether we should or not, whether we like it or not. If something works, people will use it. And we can do whatever we want, they will still use it. And uh, there are lots of examples, you know, and nobody dies, you know. I, there was even a time, this is a long time ago, because it was in the Middle Ages. In the Middle Ages, uh, officially, for a long time, the church really liked Roman numerals. And all these merchants were coming with the Arabic numerals that they learned in India, and they work better. But they couldn't because they had to use the Roman numerals. So all good merchants, they had a secret book under the other book where we're doing all the computations really efficiently, and then they showed the other one. People will use GPT in the same way. If it works better than the books, they will just not, make, you know, initially not say. Wikipedia is the same. Uh, we have done this through our history. I don't think... I remember when I was in primary school, and people started using those digital calculators, and the teacher yeah, was... Instead of logarithms. Yeah. The teacher was like, oh, you're going, to, you're going to regret. When you're old, you will find out how much <laughs> you will regret this. Okay. Maybe I will regret this, but right now I'm still doing well. <laughs> and, 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 you know, but of course, keep in mind, the machine isn't perfect, and it does make mistakes, and does make quite bad mistakes, yeah. and uh, that is quite important to keep in mind. You should double check what the machine tells you. Okay, well, I think we have to wind up there. I'm sorry I couldn't get to everybody who wanted to ask a question and to those online who wanted to ask a question too. But it's been a really interesting and uh, stimulating discussion. Thank you very much for coming and look out for more of our public lectures. And let me thank again Nello. <laughs>